Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with PrevMed, Heart Attack, Stroke, Cancer, Disability Prevention. Let's prevent all the bad stuff and stay healthy. <clears throat> uh, I, have a, I had a patient recently that complained to me because his BMI was like 21. You know, it's in this area. It's a thin guy. Uh, he was trying to gain weight, but he wasn't complaining that his BMI was so low. He was complaining that he still had insulin resistance. And it seemed to be getting worse. Um, <clears throat> this gentleman runs 10 miles a week. He uh, does a lot of weight, uh, weight lifting. And um, I had to tell him, you know, he's my metabolic doppelganger. Um, I'm the same way. I, my BMI is about 21, 22. Um, I run about 10 miles a week, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. I do uh, weight workout, several other things. <clears throat> and a few months ago, my uh, insulin resistant got worse, resistance got worse as well. It's not that we're eating some secret uh, damaging uh, food. It's that our insulin resistance is progressing. And it's not all driven by lifestyle, as you can see. <clears throat> In fact, so uh, I thought I'd do a video on it and just uh, try to get that point across. It's not always uh, lifestyle that creates diabetes. Lifestyle helps. If you're obese, the obesity, obesity epidemic does help drive the insulin epidemic. But this is from Joslin Clinic, uh, the famous uh, diabetes ep uh Diabetes Clinic at Harvard, Joslin Diabetes Center, and they're talking about, okay, thin and still type 2 diabetes, non-obese risk factors for development of disease, of diabetes, and they mention several of them. The most common one is aging. In other words, as we start getting in our, into our 50s and 60s, um, Actually, by the time, there's plenty of evidence that by, by the time we hit 60, 52% of us will have developed some level of insulin resistance. Uh, look that up. It's in um, Jenny Rule's book, uh, Blood Sugar 101. Now, they've, uh, while I was looking at the Joslin Diabetes uh, Center information, they came up with some interesting things about this. This is in the area of epigenetics. Basically, what they did was they looked at umbilical cord blood. They found a certain type of lipids and other chemical change or fats in cord blood uh, created some what we call epigenetics, some changes in the, the access to gene expression in the baby. In other words, uh, maternal obesity or diabetes during the pregnancy greatly increases the child's uh, probability of having diabetes later on. So um, we've known that for a while, we just didn't really know what the mechanism was. For those of you who are wondering what is epigenetics, uh, it's, um, I won't go too deep into it, but it's a, it's a simple concept once you start getting there. If you realize that the, uh, the genes are on chromosomes, and this large spool of DNA, six million base pairs each of us has in each of our cells. Well, if you got six million base pairs of DNA, you have to have it wound up pretty tightly. And in fact, what you've got with epigenetics is the spools that these uh, DNA strands are woven on have changes to them. So some of them you can't unwrap as well, and therefore you, if you can't unwrap the gene, the DNA, then you can't transcribe the gene, you can't express the gene, you're not going to be creating it. So it's, it's just as good as not having that gene in your system. So that is part of what's going on, at least with paternal, and even paternal, actually males can transmit some epigenetic um, uh, challenges leading to diabetes risk among their offspring. And it lasts for a generation or two. Um, so again, epigenetics is one of the causes. 
genetics themselves are a cause. There have been several different looks at, at uh, 9P21, and that's known as the heart attack gene, it used to be known as the cancer gene. Now it's becoming known as the diabetes gene because it tends to turn off um, other genes which prevent diabetes. And it happens at certain ages, again, in your 50s and 60s. <clears throat> um, well, I was just talking about 9P21, the polymorphisms associated with that, and diabetes. So, how do we, uh, what do we do with all of that? Are we doomed by our genes? Well, no. In fact, I've mentioned it many times. There are several different researchers who are looking into longevity, and most of them are focused in one way or another on this issue. Cell respiration and uh, a lot of them with the genetics and epigenetics around it. This is a, um, a slide from some of Walter Longo's work. He's the, the guy doing mimic fasting out at USC, San, uh, USC Davis. University of uh, Southern California. I'm a South Carolina guy, so every time somebody says USC to me, I'm thinking University of South Carolina. Anyhow, Walter Longo's not there. He's over at uh, University of Southern California. He's done a lot of work with mimicked fasting. What happens when he does this mimicked fasting is that he gets stem cell stimulation, and that's exactly what's going on here. These stem cells are being stimulated not during the fasting period itself, but logically it makes sense. After the, um, after the fasting period, stem cells do seem to be improved. Well now, where has he been using that? Guess what? With diabetes. He's taken, uh, he's created full-blown type 1 diabetes with mice. Uh, submitting, uh, subjected them to uh, fasting, or mimicked fasting, uh, four days, uh, a four-day period for three months, and started to get improvement and actual regrowth of beta cells that were totally wiped out in those mice. He's obviously doing a lot of work to replicate that same process in diabetics. And guess what? The diabetics are looking at that. Uh, we're hearing about it. We get re uh, referrals and calls from diabetics who've seen this and who want to try that product Proline, which is the um, the product that uh, was developed by Walter Longo to do this. They've actually even done this with uh, human cells, uh, damaged beta cells from type 1 uh, human diabetics. Put them in uh, agar plates, subjected those cells to mimic fasting, and actually started getting regrowth. Now, I don't think that's going to be a cure, and and um, I'll tell you why in, in a few minutes. There's uh, something seems to be damaging the uh, cells in the beta cells in uh, diabetic humans. So I don't think it's the failure to grow, and I don't think even if we were to do a transplant, it would work, because I think we've got to get rid of whatever it is that's damaging those beta cells in the first place. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit more. Um, remember, we've talked multiple times about near barzillai using um, uh, metformin as an anti-aging drug. And really, the only thing he's focusing on with anti-aging his glucose metabolism. He's looking at AMPK, mTOR, other enzymes that are critical to that glucose metabolism process. As glucose gets pulled across the cell membrane through the cytoplasm and broken down in the human cytoplasm. Um, <clears throat> there are other places that are doing this type of work. Scientific American uh, age is reversible. They're starting to grow human cells um, and, re and reverse aging. So, <clears throat> again, this is not so much... In, in fact, many people would say uh, the current type 2 diabetes epidemic is not being driven by obesity quite so much as it is by aging of our population. 
there will be more centenarians. The, the centenarian, in other words, people 100 years or more, that population is mushrooming and will continue to mushroom over the next 20 to 30 years. Those folks are usually tend to be diabetic because of the reasons that we're talking about. Not so much because they're, um, they're fat and they don't run. Now, and there's no question that if you exercise properly and um, lose weight, that's going to help dramatically. But, <clears throat> again, just because you exercise properly and you work out and you eat correctly, that's not going, that is not a cure for diabetes or insulin resistance. Now, you remember I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, even if we were to transplant beta cells, if we were to, if Walter Longo's efforts were to become, were to become successful and he was actually able to grow back beta cells in diabetics, I'm a little bit skeptical that that would be a permanent cure. This article is interesting. It gets into reasons why. And it talks about the uh, inflammation system, the, the immune system of humans. And it's making points that as we get older and older, our, our immune system was, you know, has been functioning so far for a good 50, 60 years. As we get older, many of our immune systems start creating inflammation in areas where it shouldn't be. For example, in arteries to cause heart attack, stroke, um, dementia. Uh, probably, according to this article, probably also in the beta cells of the pancreas. That's probably an inflammatory disease as well, at least according to that author. So you see, <clears throat> yes, you can be fit, fit, lean, lose weight, uh, work out till exhaustion, if that's what caused your diabetes, if your diabetes happened because you were overweight and didn't work out, it'll probably fix it. Uh, but for many of us, it's, it's part of getting older and it's part of our genetics. So <laughs> that's not totally a bad story. There are still ways to deal with it. Just don't get frustrated if you do all the right stuff and you don't have a miraculous cure. Thank you very much.